So a couple weeks ago I hit a major milestone, 100,000 subscribers. And I've been meaning to do something special for that, but I've been swamped. So happy 111,111 subscribers instead. You guys are all incredible. Even those two odd subscribers who dislike my videos within the first minute of me posting them. You two are my prodigal children. I love you. So my Patreon supporters funded something pretty cool. They bought me a dinner with George R. Martin at Balticon. Balticon is Baltimore's big science fiction convention. So for all of you who ever wondered what would happen when Preston met George, well, let me tell the tale. So during this dinner, George would venture from table to table. I had one course with him, specifically the salad course. So what would I ask? So I talked this over with my Patreon supporters, and we came to the conclusion that George would be tight-lipped about A Song of Ice and Fire. Is Quentin alive? Probably wouldn't get a response. I could probably get some answers to some small things, but I'm a big picture guy. However, I figured if I could get him to talk about his other works, and spoke very abstractly, I might get some answers. After all, George repeats himself a lot. So how did this strategy go? Well, it had mixed results. Generally speaking, George was very evasive. He tried sitting down and telling stories unrelated to his writing. Fans would interject with questions about his writing, he would try to answer them quickly or not at all, and then go back to talking about things other than his writing. Which brings me to my first question for him. If you're a member of the Thousand Worlds Book Club, you know that I thought Tough Voyaging, a story about a man who has an all-powerful spaceship, was a retelling of Plato's Republic. Specifically, Socrates' Parable of the Ship. In fact, I was almost certain of it. Plato's Republic has all sorts of weird things that are so similar to George R. R. Martin's work, including purple-eyed people, guardians, references to bronze and iron, similar ideas about justice. And the ownership of the spaceship in Tough Voyaging seems to mirror Plato's description of the evolution of the state, as well as the succession of the Iron Throne in A Song of Ice and Fire. But alas, this is how my question went over. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Preston. I'm a big fan of your Thousand Worlds and Tough Voyaging. Oh really? You're an old guy. Laughter. I remember when I wrote that stuff. Yeah, it's really fantastic stuff, and unless I'm interpreting it incorrectly, it was a really great connection to Plato's Republic, with Tough Voyaging at least. I don't know if I'm overreading that. Yeah, probably a little. I did read Plato a long time ago in college, I think. As you can tell, I've been out of college for a while. Oh, I was so certain it was a parable of the shit. This is Lenore. At that point, George moved on to other people. Now, I was actually sitting at the wrong table at that point and had to move back to my own table. The guy whose seat I was in was returning from the bar. Later, I talked to the people at the table to find out what questions they asked George. A nurse asked George what trimester Lysa was in when she had her tansy tea abortion. And she asked which drugs were used. George says he wasn't sure what trimester Lysa was in and that he didn't do that much research on the tansy tea. Someone else asked him about feminism. He said he used to call himself a feminist, and then a feminist told him he couldn't use that term anymore, so he stopped. By the way, believing men can only be feminist allies instead of feminists is actually a really hyper-feminist position. Anyway, the questioner told him to start calling himself a feminist again. Someone else asked if the ice dragon was in the same universe as A Song of Ice and Fire, and he said it wasn't. Meanwhile, back at my table, I was feeling pretty dejected after the Plato's Republic shoot down. I had really hoped that Tough Voyaging and A Song of Ice and Fire had a larger message about the state. And perhaps it still does? I don't know. Perhaps I saw the Republic in there because George is basing it on derivative works like Leviathan or The Manifesto. But to hear that the author hasn't looked at the Republic in 45 years makes me question all of that. Oh well. Another fan at the dinner said to me, Just because the artist didn't think that doesn't mean the art itself doesn't take on that meaning and grow beyond the creator. Yeah, I guess. But it's still tough to hear. So anyway, the feast had various foods that were inspired by the Seven Kingdoms. Some dishes were better than others. The quiche from the Reach was suspiciously like Trader Joe's mini quiches. And I tried to improve my mood by joking around with the people at the table. I stole a woman's ironborn soup because she didn't pay the iron price for it, and she in turn stole mine. So eventually George came around to our table. We were a bit lucky in that there were two no-shows at our table, leaving more time for the rest of us. It was just four of us at the table and him. The salad course was out for us, and he joked that we were the salad people. He said it was good that there were no minstrels at this dinner, a reference to the Red Wedding. And he talked a bit about signings and how his time with fans has diminished over the years, and how much he is willing to sign and how much he is willing to personalize. He talked a bit about his lower back pain and how sometimes he has to endure eight-hour signing sessions. I regained my courage and I went in for a pretty successful answer about Robert Frost. So, I have a big question. I was wondering if Robert Frost was a big influence on you. I loved his poetry, but you mean ice and fire? And fire and ice, yeah. 
Yeah, I was certainly familiar with the song. Yeah, or poem, rather. I read Dream Songs, and you had another thing about the path less taken. I don't know, it's dressing. I was thinking about putting it on the salad. George began having a conversation about salad dressing with somebody else at the table. So, boom, A Song of Ice and Fire does seem to be in reference to Robert Frost's anti-war, end-of-the-world poem, Fire and Ice. I was hoping to ask about the wall and the Frost poem, The Mending Wall, but George clearly didn't want to talk about it further, so I didn't press it. Anyway, there's an Italian at our table, and the conversation soon moved to pizza. It turns out both George and I went to college in Chicago, and are familiar with Chicago-style pizza. For those that don't know, Chicago-style pizza can really only be found in Chicago. Contrary to popular belief, it's not thick crust pizza. It's more like a pie filled with cheese with sauce on the top. So George called Chicago-style pizza an abomination. Oh well, nobody's perfect. Chicago-style pizza, especially Giordano's, is fucking incredible. So a woman at our table then asked why he wore a turtle on his hat. He explained that it's from a character in the Wild Card series called the Great and Powerful Turtle, but it's also when he was young he would buy turtles at the dime store and was shocked when the turtles would kill each other. I then went in for another question, a bit of a softball. So turtles have this secret fire, and so does the character of the Great and Powerful Turtle. He has this angry side to him. And you said that the Great and Powerful Turtle was the most like you. Do you also have an angry side? Have you read my work? Laughter. I think you can find the answer there. Laughter. In real life, I try to control my worst impulses, but they come out sometimes. But I haven't murdered anyone that I know of. Poor great and powerful turtle, he ends up murdering a lot of people. Yeah, but they deserved it. Now it's the end of the exchange that's kind of interesting. You see, in Wild Cards, the turtle ends up creating a huge tidal wave that kills all of the villains. The turtle later feels guilty about this and actually retires. Though George said the villains, who were the jumpers, deserved it. So while George writes a lot about peace, it is possible for a group to become sufficiently evil to warrant destruction. And the jumpers in the wildcard series were cartoonishly evil. This seems to align with George's comments that the Nazis were also adversaries that warranted war. The real question in Ice and Fire is whether any group has reached that level of evil. Certainly the Mountain's men and the Brave Companions, and possibly Euron's men. But George has said repeatedly that it's very difficult for him to dismiss entire groups because of the diversity in them. The Italian then asked George if Lady Stoneheart was going to appear in the show. George said no, that she'd been cut. He said if he were involved in the show, things would be different, but he's busy trying to finish books. I reassured him that it was fine, and told him that readers haven't even processed the first five books yet. I made a joke that he could drop the Winds of Winter and finish Avalon, and I'd be cool with it. No one laughed at that joke. George says that he likes writing in a fashion that rewards repeated readings, which is kind of cool. Anyway, a woman at the table then asked if the others are purely evil, or if they're more three-dimensional characters. George said she'll have to wait and find out. Anyway, I then began to gush a little to George R. R. Martin. You know, this Tower of Ashes and Meat House Man and A Song for Leah, they all punched me in the gut so hard. You're fantastic at endings, and no one knows how good you are at them. Well, I hope they feel that way when I end this one. Anyway, I then decided to go full nerd and ask this question. I'm sorry for annoying you with all the Thousand Worlds stuff, but I had one question I really wanted to ask you. In a song for Leah, if you remember the Grishka, I was wondering if the Grishka had Psy lured Rob and gained that ability from Liana, or if it's supposed to be left as a mystery. I don't think that would be my interpretation. It's an interesting idea. It's just that the Grishka, people had started converting when it had taken in a telepath. I thought it was maybe absorbing powers like the Borg, I guess I was wrong. I don't know, maybe you were right. I wrote that story in 1973 and it may have faded in my mind. I think you're more familiar with it than I am. Of course, I'd ask that question because the Grishka is so similar to the Children of the Forest. I was looking to see if the children were trying to absorb powers from Bran. George was definitely not biting. So next, George started talking about his theater in Santa Fe and I brought up Forbidden Planet. He enthusiastically declared that Forbidden Planet was his favorite movie. I mentioned that the plot was similar to Renly's death with Stannis, but George then started a conversation with someone else. Anyway, George signed all our books, and I got a photo with him. He later told another fan that Arya and Gendry will meet again, and Sweet Robin ended the evening by eating some lemon cake. A couple days later, at a book signing, I asked if the Brave Companions will return. George said yes, at least the ones that aren't dead. I later played Mexican Bingo with the Ice and Fire artist John Picaccio. He was a really nice guy, and man, is his art incredible. I also attended a reading where George read a new Aaron chapter. He first had the audience vote on which chapter he should read. I screamed out Aaron King like it was the king's moot. 
I think I maybe got five or six other people to chant with me. The new Aeron chapter is incredible, so check it out. Down the road, I will do a video on each of the released Winds of Winter chapters, but that'll be certainly after Season 6 ends. Anyway, that's about it. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for being a subscriber and listening to me rant about a silly fantasy book. And again, many thanks to my Patreon supporters. You successfully got me to harass George R. R. Martin. Thanks again, and see you soon.